all, and welcome to the Wednesday meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. We have a special presentation today um, uh, presented by the County Administration, and this is a, uh, a policy lab presentation. And uh, today, Mr. Rickoff, who is here for in Mr. Mokrahyski's absence, is our County Administrator. And Mr. Rickoff, I'm going to ask you in a moment to introduce the panel, but I'd like to say hello personally to uh, Ben Cross. Thank you for being here today. Steve Adams, I've said hello to you at least three times today and four times yesterday, so I'll dispense with that. And uh, I think that, um, let's see, uh, is that Colin is here? And uh, Dan, Allison, and Hannah are here. Welcome this morning. Mr. Rickoff, please introduce your panel. Chair for our commissioners, thank you very much. And if I may be so bold as to borrow a page from your playbook and quote you to you, um, you said uh, a few weeks ago that this was one of your favorite days of the year, and I have to tell you, it is one of mine as well. We started the policy lab in in 2018, and I am now in the enviable position of having helped launch this with Professor Ben Clark uh, in in 2018, and I'm having a chance to step away and see it continue on in with great strength um, and agility. I am so pleased with this effort. We're now in our second uh, three-year commitment to the university, and we could go on and on with the remarkable pieces of work that this has generated in the past. We could talk about the Snowmageddon after action report. We could talk about uh, clean air spaces research. Um, I have this long list, but today is not talking about the great work that has been done in the past. It is a chance to talk about the future. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our um, policy director, Steve Adams, and to Professor Ben Clark, who uh, has been our colleague all the way through this effort. I don't know which of you would like to go first. I will maybe offer just a, a couple of uh, remarks, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Commissioners. It is a great pleasure. Um, as you know, um, uh, Mr. Rickoff is moving over to uh, show leadership for our newly established uh, Community Justice uh, and Rehabilitation Services Department. Um, and in my role, um, newly appointed role as Policy Director for County Government, I, I have uh, among other duties, the um, the enviable duty of working um, on a weekly basis with uh, Professor Clark um, on carrying the uh, policy lab work forward. This is um, a piece of work that is really near and dear to my heart. Um, I have um, a professional training in this area. My um, graduate uh, program um, at the ASCU School of Public uh, Policy at the Florida State University in Tallahassee. Um, I attended where I received a master's of public administration. I too once did a capstone project. It was many years ago, and it was focused on county government in North Florida. Um, I am now almost 30 years out um, from some of the work that I did in that time. Um, but, you know, I've had the opportunity to serve at um, various levels of government. Um, and it is really quite um, uh, it's humbling to think about uh, the many the opportunities that, um, you know, that capstone um, offers you. I just had a few moments just uh, this morning to talk to some of the students who will be presenting. They're graduating. Uh, at least three of them are, and they're already starting to think about what they're going to do next. Uh, it's really exciting to uh, be at that moment. But the kind of practical work um, that we are able to see um, as part of professional training is just one way that this county takes full advantage of having a world-class research institution um, right here in our backyard. It really ups our game, uh, our ability to not only train potential future colleagues who will be joining us at this table to staff you, um, it also enables us to have daily, weekly interactions with the faculty here who are thinking about cutting edge research. So it really is a huge benefit. So I am so grateful to all of you for making the time um, for this. And with that, I'm going to introduce my, uh, uh, hand it off to my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Clark. All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Commissioner Farr and the rest of the commissioners. Um, thank you all for having us here again. Uh, it's great to be back in person. Spent the last couple years uh, remote. Um, and, and and like gentlemen have said, this is definitely the, the most wonderful time of the year. I'll spare you the singing of the song, but, um, you know, 
for me, this partnership has been uh, a godsend in so many ways because uh, it enables us in the school of 3PM to get our students in real professional experience earlier on, uh, develop their skills so that we can create that pipeline from the university to, to this government and to others across the, the county and the state and the nation and prepare them in ways that uh, if we're just kind of doing hypotheticals, that it's really not possible. So um, again, I, I really thank you all for, for the opportunity to be in this partnership, to give them those opportunities. Um, uh, as you see on the agenda, there are a couple of, of projects we'll be presenting here today. Uh, we've done several others this year uh, that, we, that took place at different times of the year, and they weren't quite ready to kind of come back uh, and present those, but we'll be surely happy to share the results from that. Um, we have a couple of undergraduate groups um, working on, on projects this year, which is a sort of a new addition to the policy lab this year, and both of them actually outside of the School of Planning, Public Policy and Management. So that's, again, part of the role uh, that I see the policy lab as sort of an entryway into the other venues of, of knowledge within the university as well. So we're uh, working with an undergraduate who's been doing work on, on zinc and so the demossing agents that people just kind of throw around to get that off their roof and doing it kind of willy-nilly, willy having a lot of impact on, uh, on aquatic uh, critters. Um, and so uh, this uh, student has actually been working for the last couple of years on, on a number of different uh, projects around that, doing some laboratory work, some background work, that sort of stuff. Uh, so hopefully we have some actual sort of report on that, on that very soon. And then uh, we had a group of uh, undergraduate business students through the Oregon Consulting Group uh, that surveyed business owners around uh, Lane County on their preparedness for a, a range of different types of disasters, COVID, wildfires, earthquakes, those kind of things, so that we can uh, hopefully be a little more resilient to what disasters may come. So again, both of those uh, projects we'll, we'll be happy to share with you all um, in time uh, as, as those uh, become available. And then uh, I think at this point, we'll just kind of turn the floor over to our, our two groups from the Master of Public Administration Capstone course. Uh, which, uh, again, is the sort of culminating um, classroom project where they're bringing together all the different kind of pieces uh, of their, their degree um, on these projects. So um, thank you very much for your time. While this set up, um, Mr. Clark, Ben, I think that I called you Ben Cross this morning, didn't I? Uh, that's possible. <laughs> I, I think I did. I was thinking about uh, one of my favorite movies, and uh, he played Harold, Harold Abrams in that. So. Okay, good morning. Thank you for inviting me here this morning. I'll be presenting on our evaluation of coordinated entry in Lane County on behalf of my colleagues and co-authors, Amani and Strick, who couldn't be here this morning. Um, they're with me in spirit. What is coordinated entry? Basically, it's just the way the county works with nonprofits who provide housing um, in order to end homelessness in a way that's unified, um, pass the funding around, um, and make sure not everybody's doing something different in order to end a, a social problem that affects us all. So. Just some quick background. Uh, it's been mentioned already, but we are Masters of Public Administration students at the University of Oregon, finishing our one-year final terminal research project. Uh, we did this with the Institute for Policy Research and Engagement, the Policy Lab folks up here, and our clients at Lane County HSD. So what have we been working on for a whole year? Um, it basically always goes back to this graph. So as you can see on the green line is the number of people who have been assessed for vulnerability. Um, which is basically how likely they are to die without a housing intervention from the public sector. It's this is um, the segment of this year, so it's always been more than 500 people on this wait list. Last time I checked it, it was over 700. Um, barely visible on the flat line at the bottom is how many people actually get a housing intervention per week or so. Um, uh, there's no one reason for this, um, but as I understand it, um, 
when someone is considered the most vulnerable, they have a very high score on the assessment I'm going to talk about in a minute. We do have programs available for them. It's more in the middle where we can still help people, but somebody who's very vulnerable goes to the front of the line in the current system. And so we never quite get around to giving an intervention for those folks in the middle who are moderately to low vulnerable, maybe can resolve their own homelessness, but still need help. In order to put people on the wait list, there's a assessment called the front door assessment in Lane County. We use a tool called the Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool, otherwise known as VI SPIDAT, which I probably should have made my middle name on my diploma at this point because I've been saying it so much. Um, so it's used to refer people experiencing ho uh, homelessness to a housing program, either permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing. This tool was found to be racially inequitable in other communities. And so the staff at HSD and HHS hope to replace it with something much better. It looks like this, um, but it's possible to modify it. So how did we do our investigation? Um, just really quickly, we got through 20 calls with people who do coordinated entry assessments in Lane County. So that included um, the assessors who actually work at HHS, as well as the like six of the nonprofits that are in the continuum of care, um, and also some folks from uh, cities and other people who are knowledgeable about this topic. Um, we got 36 responses to a survey of people with lived experience of homelessness as they were completing the assessment. And then we also did an anonymous written survey of some of the folks I mentioned before who worked for the continuum of care. And finally, we talked to folks in these uh, continuum of care in four capital cities around the US. So Austin, Texas, Charlotte, North Carolina, um, some folks in Minneapolis and Richmond, Virginia. Many, many people helped us do this. Like I mentioned before, I won't read out all the names. Um, they were all wonderful. We learned so much. And so I just wanted to say thank you to them at this moment. It doesn't show too well, but. Um, still an animation there, sorry. Here's some quick findings from the survey of people who had lived experience of homelessness. Participants were asking for clear information about how the referral process works. They wanted to know where they would be on the wait list and get some kind of active communications that indicates to me that that system is not built out as much as it should be. Um, people are hopeful that they will get help. You know, if there's no way of knowing or they don't know how the system works, we don't want them to lose hope. Maybe they shouldn't be on the wait list in the first place. We have some way to divert them out of it. There's also a need for follow-up after the front door assessment is completed. They expire after six months, and that's basically the way people exit the chart I showed you before most often, um, especially if they're not chronically homeless or have a, a family or some other high level of vulnerability. Um, folks don't necessarily get told that that's what will happen, and so better information about that will be helpful to them. Our stakeholder interviews. Um, these are the 20 folks we talked to that I mentioned before. I would have loved to have kept going. We learned so much from people about how their work works. Um, but our purpose was to gather data from them about the perceptions of their jobs and how they feel about VI SPIDAT. I asked them to give it a grade. Um, and when we aggregated those results, it was mostly a negative opinion. So if it's a grade like school, it would have been about a D plus, um, which is not acceptable in grad school. Um, I can maybe hear my teachers behind me going like, no, Colin, too much text, but I wanted to keep at least some of the quotes we, we got from folks up here. There's many, many more in the final report if you're interested in reading it. I hope so. One question we asked, what are some of the challenges you encountered using the VI SPIDAT? Um, one manager said the clients are not answering the questions that would let them rank higher on the vulnerability scale, but we have to go with how they answer. Another person said scores vary very widely depending on who is doing the scoring. I also asked what their experience was using it, uh, the VI SPIDAT to assess different kinds of people, basically, um, without defining that. One county manager said, if you're not asking people if they've lost opportunities because of their identity, you're not accurately reflecting vulnerabilities. So there's no such question on the tool used by Lane County. Also, one assessor says the VI SPIDAT does not adequately capture when people are medically fragile. Actually, we heard that from a few people. There's just not that many questions toward med medicine and health compared to how other communities are asking those questions. Um, and those things are very integrated, I think. Uh, finally, one very experienced assessor in our community says he's been known to modify the wording of the question so as not to insult someone. So there's room for changing the wording as well. Um, just a little bit on how to read this. I asked people a binary question. Do they believe the VI SPIDAT has the qualities that HUD requires a, a standardized assessment tool to have or not? So 
the orange means it does not have this quality. The blue means it does. Generally, people believe that the VS bidet um, reflects a policy of person-centeredness and housing first. That's pretty good. Most disagreed that it was reliable or based on the strengths of the person being assessed. And then there was some disagreement on these qualities in the middle. Um, basically, room for improvement across the board. We did ask people what they would change. And so here's some suggestions from all the folks we talked to. Um, I pulled out one other quote also from a longtime assessor saying they would make the questions more flexible. It, the tool is not easy amended, so it would be nice to change it to reflect the person you were interviewing. So adding questions related to gender and LGBTQ status, some different kinds of reports in HMIS, better ways of tracking outcomes. My colleagues behind me have some suggestions for changing HMIS as well. So I would recommend folding some of this into there over time. Um, I mentioned before, like follow-up feedback channels for people who have actually taken the assessments. And then finally, uh, as I understand it, assessors don't really have a, a, a method of giving comment or what program they think is right for somebody, like somebody who might be very vulnerable would still be very successful in a less expensive intervention than the most supportive housing, but there's no way to give input um, at this time. Just really quickly, some of our results from other communities and what that indicated that other people are doing. Um, other counties are sometimes deciding to discard VI SPAT or at least modify it. Um, we heard people coming up with their own screening tools, their own definitions of vulnerability. Um, and basically the indication we got once I contacted like staff counterparts in these other communities is that they're all working on this, they're all learning how. And so I think um, I only get to work on this for a year. Um, so whatever is learned across the country, I think that's something your staff should continue to conference with others and then make progress on this important, difficult social issue. Also one thing, I made sure to ask about is how they're funding all this. Um, several people indicated that they used their new ARPA funding in order to work on their homelessness policy um, and develop their, their supportive housing and, and uh, build out their HHS staff. But that's not a long-term solution unless longer-term funding is secured. So, you know, more money, more money for more problems, right? But um, uh, thinking ahead past like the, the available pot of money now in order to create a long-term solution to homelessness is important. And then before I move on to my recommendations, I guess I just wanted to say, I think what I've learned the most from this about housing and poverty and homelessness and um, just doing social good through regional government is how committed people in this community are to working on those problems of finding a solution to working together. Um, and so before I make my uh, inevitably very modest contribution to what we know about that, I just wanted to say one more time, thank you to all of them for teaching me. and. Um, hoping to work with them in the future because I know this is where I belong and what I want to work on. So here's our recommendations, I promise. Replace the VI SPIDAT. So the VI SPIDAT should no longer be the sole decision-making tool for housing referral. Um, I know your, your staff and a stakeholder group have come together um, to work on a recommendation to Poverty and Homelessness Board. That won't happen all at once. Um, but we're moving in that direction. And so I think I think the support of that effort is, I mean, it's just gonna take a while, um, but it's worth it. There should also be a phased assessment. So a phased assessment process means pre-screening folks before they do the hour long assessment in HMIS, make sure they don't get on a wait list that won't help them. Um, there's some models of that around the country that you can look at. As I mentioned before, more channels for input from assessors and cage managers on what program to actually refer people to. Uh, we saw some communities around the country that were doing excellent communication to the public about their local statistics, um, as well as feedback just given to individuals who actually need help, just kind of beyond a phone number to call. You know, I, as far as I know, our physical access points aren't reopened yet in this county either. Um, so there's models around the country as well of how to expand those systems. Um, it, it, this comes up over and over again in different projects topics as well, but the geographical constraints in Lane County also get in the way. So our continuum of care has plenty of services to offer people, Eugene, Springfield, even Cottage Grove, rural Lane County, that's not been as true. Um, your county staff, I think, have a lot of territory to cover outside of the communities. And then we also weren't even able to talk to anybody in Florence. Um, there's room for expansion of collaboration out in that direction as well. Recommendation five, um, this is outside the scope of what we were looking at, but continue growing the permanent supportive housing inventory. 
Um, I know you've been very supportive of that. I've seen those those buildings being stood up. I think we need more. Keep at it. Um, and that'll solve some of the issue we've been talking about is just not related to the assessment necessarily. The assessment has to have somewhere for people to go. And so that's what people said the most often when we asked, what's the hardest thing about your job? It's like having somewhere to send people to live and be safe. Um, and uh, I, I, I guess I have to say on a, a personal note, like something I do when I'm not a grad student is travel around the state and make friends with families who live in this public housing and seeing like how much that helps and and grows their families when they have access to that is meaningful to me. And so I hope we can continue doing that in Oregon where housing is very constrained. Finally, 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 secure the stable funding for staff and programs that I talked about. Um, that's just about it. So I wanted to say thank you one more time to Sarai Johnson at CIO and James Ewell at HSD for being lovely clients and our teachers, um, our, our professors at the University of Oregon as well, Ben Clark, Anako, and Melissa who are behind me. Um, I pre Lane County and you all. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Mr. Hill, thank you very much. Uh, I've taken photographs of everything. Um, is there any chance you could provide the slide deck to the Board of County Commissioners? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. And then uh, I'll I'll look to you, uh, Director Adams. Uh, shall we ask questions after each presentation, or shall we wait until the end? Uh, Chair Farr, I believe questions would be in order at this time. Thank you. Then uh, let's so open the floor for questions from the uh, from the Board of Commissioners. I'll begin with Commissioner Buck, followed by Vice Chair Trigger. First, thank you so much for taking the opportunity to utilize this as one of your topics. Um, this is news to me, so it's important that you bring this forward or policy folks like ourselves wouldn't be made aware. What made you decide that this was the subject you wanted to research? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. So when I moved to Eugene, I thought I wanted to do city stuff and transportation and um, and labor organizing. And I'm all about the health now after we got to work on these projects. So this was technically assigned to me by Ben. I got to show my my order of choice. I wanted to work on housing and homelessness. Um, and uh, I, I wouldn't have picked another topic, certainly. So I, I, I hope to come back and continue working on this in the future. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair Trigger. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. This is very exciting for so many reasons. Um, and and I'll just echo Commissioner Buck's comments to appreciate y'all picking up these particular topics as what you're digging into and um, helping give us a little more insight into some of the some of the issues. I'm especially interested in um, bef before you got to the part about that there are other communities that do a different assessment for their scale of vulnerability. That was my first question: is who who designed this tool and how locked into using it are we? Because clearly it needs. It needs uh, some fixing. Um, I'm curious, I have two really specific questions. One is whether the ranking affects anything other than place in line on the coordinated entry wait list. In other words, are, do folks get services while they're on the coordinated entry wait list that, are, that they're referred to because of their vulnerability ranking? Or is it simply used to put them in, in an order? Do you know? Yeah. Can you go ahead and answer that, Kate? <laughs> sure. Uh, so we are working to increase the number of pre-program resources that those who have the very highest vulnerabilities would receive. The Navigation Center is a really good example of that, of course, where now if someone is um, close to being referred to permanent supported housing, they would be prioritized for the Navigation Center. Uh, and so while there aren't a large number of resources today, we know that the capacity will grow in the future uh, to ensure that those with the highest needs are receiving the greatest number of resources from the beginning of when their assessment has been completed. Great, thank you. Um, my other question is as much a, a comment, which I don't know how much it came up in your studies about our work towards the creation of a behavioral health stabilization center for crisis intervention for folks with um, experience in mental health crisis. But I can't imagine in the vulnerability index, a lot of questions come up or there are opportunities to see that that's actually what a person needs next before they're even ready ready for housing. We know that those services are gonna be part of that off ramp to, to more successful stable housing. So, um, so I will close by saying, I love hearing that you said, you first thought it was all about what you wanted to do was at the city level and transportation, all important things, but that now you're, you're uh, really intrigued by and looking towards county government as a, as a place because um, 
I'm, I'm with you there. I believe there's really, you know, we are essentially providing services to the most vulnerable people in our community. And so your insights and what you learned through this project and your clear commitment to continuing that work is, is really wonderful. And we hope you stick around and look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you, Commissioner. I, uh, I, um, I made Gina email me the, the PowerPoint about the third center. So and once I heard about that, I was like, oh yeah, that too, we need, we need it all. And, and that, that, that way, like, People who are just suffering from addiction or can't work temporarily, like don't go onto that wait list and don't don't see results. So we have, we need just other options for our folks. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and your effort and your commitment to the to the topic. Thank you, Vice Chair. Commissioner Bolzvich. Thank you. So um remembering the TAC report and looking back at it, we started coordinated entry back in 2015. So it's a relatively new system here in Lane County. And I'm not quite sure. I think we started using the 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 V spat I'm gonna get the darn V spat um then and uh so other than the fact that that's not probably the best tool to be using, um you got a chance to interview a bunch of people that are involved in the system, whether they're lived experience or the actual service providers. Were there any other observations outside of our assessment tool maybe that you you might suggest to improve that coordinated entry system or there are there agencies missing from it or you know just in in general because I, I i i can really see that we do need to look at maybe other tools and be talking you know about what's the state of the art um and, and probably the most uh, effective system for doing those assessments but you have you had a chance to get some insight as a as a third party researcher so is is there something that you could that that just stood out like we also ought to be doing this like like your comment about permanent supportive housing wasn't necessarily about the assessment tool um anything else Thank you, Commissioner. I believe personally that there's a lot of room for expanding the organizations that participate in the continuum of care. Um, there's only nine of them, if you include the county, I believe. And so that, you know, I, I'm looking at the 11 cities in front of me, and I mean, none of them are in it. That's just not what cities do, but I don't see why. If I could get them on the phone and try to make them participate, and I, I think care about health and, and public housing, right? Um, I also, I, asked almost everybody what they knew about rural homelessness and what to do about it. And no, nobody really gave me much of an answer. Um, which is I, I like the, the evidence of like outreach there was just kind of like fragmented or in some, some areas may not exist um, or is all in the county. And so I think there's also room there for like a way of having a social worker interact with people either in our smaller communities or rural Lane County um, that's not a police officer, right? Um, just in case that's what they won't respond to. Um, and then we didn't see a lot of evidence of that. Uh, there's there's a there's a group that works with the continuum of care in Cottage Grove, but um, we didn't find a similar group in Oak Ridge or Florence, right? Um, and like, as you know, homelessness levels are the highest in Eugene, and that's where the access points are. But I think like find, finding a way to get that outreach more mobile, maybe like maybe even fixed access points in our other like regional communities here is doable. You know, like I looked at Charlotte, for example, which is in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, where they have seven cities and a county and like those seven cities basically take up the whole territory. So we just have a different like level of analysis here. We have a county that's the size of the state that's mostly rural, right? But that doesn't mean there aren't homeless or people experiencing homelessness or vulnerable people outside the cities um i think maybe you hear about this kind of thing a lot but it's very mpa brand of me to like kind of try to find solutions to that that are appropriate for what we have to work with um in the mountain ranges that divide us and so on so just to reiterate one more time um i think yeah i okay here's my point i i heard that there were people who would maybe like they really care about housing folks and helping folks and they don't want to participate in the system for various reasons, either they don't want to work with the county, but sometimes is that they don't want to work with the assessment tool, they don't find it useful. And so if there's something that people are more in agreement or more willing to collaborate on in order to assessing vulnerability, then you may see 
more people volunteer to do the street outreach and then send people into a system that will help. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> I'll then, uh, with no further questions from the board, I have a few questions myself. The first thing I'm going to get out of the way is that um, if you're listening closely, you heard Mr. Rickoff allude to the fact that I, I take down quotes and, and repeat quotes, and I do that. Um, and I'm going to repeat a quote that you said, and I've taken down a number of your quotes that I will credit you when I use them. I will use them. Um, but uh, you said this. You said, let me find this. I only get to do this work on this for a year. Well, I think we can help with that. <laughs> so if, if this is an area that you wish to continue, I think Lane County is one of the most superb places to continue that work. And as you can see, as well as we are doing, there are things we can do far better than we are doing already. And uh, the second thing I'll say about that is uh, <clears throat> you mentioned Miss Bud, you called her by first name, Kate. I trust that you've met and that you've, you've not met until today. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> then uh, Miss Bud. Meet. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's the introduction, and and really, um, the if you had been present for our presentation yesterday on housing, what you'd have seen is a a, a new light shone on the way that we both uh, conduct and report our housing, uh, both our goals and our and our progress and regress, uh, as regress may be the case, uh, and measuring and and actually measuring your performance versus how you did, as well as how others do, but more significantly against how well you did. It's really important to me. And a couple of your slides <clears throat> mentioned such. Um, one of them, one slide was uh, you talked about communicating. Um, well, let me find the exact slide here. And pardon me for fumbling just a little bit, but uh, I will. It was uh, a communicate, improve feedback given to individuals who enter the central wait list and improve transparency with the public. You mentioned when you were talking about that statistics, uh, providing statistics of, as to how the performance is, is uh, um, progressing, regressing, et cetera, and statistics that are meaningful to the people who are seeing the statistics. You know, it's providing statistics in a big block with the not, not knowing exactly where in the block to look is not uh, very helpful to so many people. So I'm not gonna ask you to go into detail, but I would imagine that your research along with the research of um, uh, Imani and Strick, uh, your, the team that you worked on, you, worked, talk, you looked at statistics at, uh, to a certain extent. Is that a correct assessment? Uh, that's correct. We had access to the Built for Zero workbook to compare to other counties um, as your, your staff on that works even more closely than we got to. Then uh, with your permission and with permission of your professor, I'd love to hear more about that subsequent to this meeting, because uh, that is something that I'm very interested in. I believe that we can get better only by knowing how well or how poorly we are doing and how historically we are trending. And that is uh, the only way you do that is by measuring and reporting the measurements in ways that people understand. I'm not going to go into too much detail, more detail about that. There, were, there was another slide that you did talk about statistics. But the last thing I'd like to talk about in this wonderful presentation, you know, send, send the slide deck and I may, if it's okay to communicate with you beyond this meeting, I'd, I'd love to hear more from you and the rest of your team. But um, <clears throat> you wrote down a few quotes. You, you gave us a few, few very specific quotes from, uh, from um, managers and, uh, and um, the assessor. Uh, and we got five quotes in here, good quotes. And I would trust that you have more than just the five. Um, I'd love to see the, the book on those quotes because those are very important to me, hearing what people actually are willing to state out loud, particularly in a non-threatening environment, which I'd presume that you, you presented them with. You know, if I ask them, they may hedge their answer, but if you ask them, I would guess that you're gonna get direct quotes, direct answers that uh, that uh, I would love to hear more on. So with the with your permission and with the permission of your professor, I'd love to be in touch with you after this meeting to hear a little bit more in depth about your presentation. Because, Ms. Bud, this is really important to us. It, and, uh, and having a set of three sets of eyes on the outside watching our work, because our eyes tend to look this direction and their eyes look in this direction. So I'm excited. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Uh, thank you, commissioners. And uh, as soon as I turn in the final report, I'll have a lot of free time because I will no longer be a student. So. Well, that is a wonderful thing. Um, we can talk more about that. <laughs> um, Chair, Mr. Rekha. Chair Farr, if I may, um, I have a quick question. I noted uh, that uh, there were references to uh, individuals, assessors, 
uh, modifying the tool on the fly. And you also had the, the one chart saying that some counties are actually redesigning uh, the visa spadat. Um, I imagine it could be rife with peril to have assessors perhaps changing the nature of the question. Do you have any thoughts about you know, what direction we should go with that? How do we, if this is the tool that we are going to continue to use, I don't know what else is out there that we could examine. And maybe this is for you too, Kate. Um, what is our best alternative here? Do we allow a flexibility in the moment um, and really commit to training assessors? Um, or do we need to be reworking the tool somewhat? Give your ideas. Uh, nice to meet you in person too, by the way, Greg. Um, uh, I, I have a few suggestions along those lines. Um, when we talked to the folks in Minneapolis, one thing they, no, no, I'm sorry, it was the folks in, in Charlotte. Um, they, they wrote some questions on their tool that would get at the impacts of structural racism without Acting, asking that so directly or technically, um, that's one thing that we can make some progress on. Um, so in, in general, rewriting those questions would be about like compassionate and also like get at those, those structural things to improve equity outcomes from the tool. Um, I, I'm sure I wrote some other things in the report about that. And it's all in my head at once. So, and then Kate can go ahead and take over from here. The quote about somebody changing the language in order not to offend somebody was really stuck out to me and something that I would certainly want us to examine. Oh, so I, I, sorry, one other thing. Um, we, we also heard from from folks who work with uh, people with intellectual disabilities, they don't find the tool useful. So like, again, like a little more, it's somewhat, I think the answer may be lying in a, like a little bit more flexibility, at least just like, like train, train the assessors better, but let them have more input on case management, like improve the case management. Well, instead of instead of treating people like a number, basically, um, especially because because not everybody's the same, and like the the statistics don't necessarily reflect that until we have more information that's personal and creates a personal connection with the assessor and case manager. So, just a bit of history: the HUD does not have identified tools that they endorse in any way. And when coordinated entry was introduced, uh, now almost 10 years ago, uh, it was just shared that, that there should be an assessment tool. And so an agency called Org Code that's actually based in Canada created the VI SPDAT, and then there's another assessment called the SPDAT. And because there were not many formal assessment tools, communities really jumped on adopting this tool. And nationwide, it was used primarily. And it was just in the last four to, to three years that that data came out indicating that, that there uh, were disproportionalities created as a result of the VI SPDAT. And so it's in the last two years, and COVID, of course, has been thrown on top of that, that communities have started revising their tool. And so our opportunity very much is to bring our community together and have important conversations about what does, does vulnerability look to Lane County and what are the key um, factors that need to be incorporated into an assessment tool to ensure that, that we're able to identify you know, who is most vulnerable. The, the challenge, of course, is that, that everyone is a strong advocate. And so we don't want to create a tool where basically everyone is kind of rising to the top because everyone has high needs um, because, you know, we don't nearly have enough resources as was illustrated. And so we want to make sure that we are creating as inclusive a process as possible to have these conversations about what questions need to be used. And also that we're looking at the, the overall purpose of an assessment tool to differentiate vulnerabilities among individuals. And the other part of the question is, what in addition to the assessment tool do we want to look at in order to identify vulnerabilities? And so many communities have incorporated the length of time that someone's experiencing homelessness or the severity of someone's disability. And so as you can imagine, this is a, a very uh, in-depth and time-consuming conversation is incredibly important. Uh, and it was very much something that, that 
I wanted to make sure we started as soon as I came into this community um, because the VI SPDAT is not an acceptable tool to just simply kind of rest and utilize uh, for a long-term basis. And so I um, really appreciate all our staff who have been working to move this conversation forward. Uh, and I'd be glad to continue to keep you updated on how we're progressing our, our uh, assessment of vulnerabilities of individuals in the community. Thank you, Ms. Budd. Um, Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That opened up a whole other um, line of thought for me and uh, also sort of spurred by Greg's comment. I, I, It's unfortunate that we have a tool that's so imperfect that our assessors have to adapt on the fly, but how wonderful that we have assessors who are, who are sensitive to and nimble enough to do that. That's really important. Um, but it also makes me think about um, more broadly as an organization, how we might use those findings um, particularly the disparate impact for, for certain groups to inform other prevention interventions here at the county. Because by the time someone's on our coordinated entry wait list and getting an assessment, we've already failed them in multiple ways. Um, whether it's the big we, the big societal cultural we, or we as an organization, or we as a safety net um, and, and um, continuum of care. But I just think it's such a rich, you know, there's so much information there to inform so many other like I say, particularly prevention and intervention programs here at the county and more broadly. So to me, this is a perfect example. One of the things we hear a lot in the community about work uh, to end homelessness is why is everyone so siloed? And I think we have to be careful not to conflate being siloed with uh, then doing away with spe specialty areas of specialty. Um, so this is, I think, an opportunity for us as an organization and with community partners to maybe mine the findings of um, whatever assessment tool we use to share across departments and across community partners um, and other initiatives to really get at things at the front end, because ultimately the way we're going to functionally reduce homelessness is to reduce the number of people who are, who are homeless, and that starts way further upstream um, than, than we're able to get at right now. It, based on your report and the feedback here, I would say, please hold off on changing that middle name. <laughs> wait for the next tool <laughs> and the more uh, refined tool well thank you very much and thank you vice chair thanks for the presentation um and i see no questions from the board but i'm going to mention one thing that we talk about all the time and you brought it up already and that is uh, uh there are no places to send people um once they have been assessed with a need for uh, for housing and uh, we talk about that continually, the need for more front doors, for more housing in Lane County. That's not your, not, it's not part of your study, but it is a part of what we do on a regular basis. And um, but thank you very much. I will state that um, we, uh, in the last couple of days, we've had some pretty eye-opening presentations already, and we have one more to come. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. I look forward to being in touch with you and uh, and continuing your work. Uh, poverty and homelessness is, uh, is uh, it's a never-ending subject, and uh, and it's uh, you say you get to work in it for one year. I'll bet you work in it for a lot, lot more than one year. So thank you very much. And please pass along uh, our thanks to your teammates. Great, ready for another one? <laughs> All right, so today I will be presenting on an evaluation of the homeless management information system for Lane County. My name is Hannah and these are my teammates, Dan and Allison. So our team worked with local service providers to assess how data is being collected and used for the homeless management information system or HMIS in Lane County. What makes this project important? As you're probably aware, Lane County and more specifically Eugene, um, unfortunately has the highest amount of homeless individuals on a per capita basis in the country. <coughs> There's a huge need in the county for wider access to services and outreach to help reduce the number of people on the streets and to get them into safe shelters. And research has shown that data collection and management is the number one way to tackle this issue. 
without the proper knowledge of the numbers, the characteristics and needs of the homeless individuals, as well as the number of people receiving services and the capacity of those services, it's a really difficult um, way to manage the crisis. So measuring the extent of homelessness is essential to combating it. Uh, there's This can get pretty technical, so I just wanted to kind of quickly go over this. So the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, otherwise known as HUD, um, develops the framework for the continuum of care or COC and all continuum of care participants have to um, you utilize HMIS. And so um, that's just HMIS is just the general term that they use, uh, but each locality chooses their own system for that. And so Lane County uses WellSky um, as well as 60% of the nation also uses WellSky. So it's a pretty big system that's widely used across the nation. So what is HMIS? HMIS is a local information technology system used to collect client level data on the provision of services to homeless individuals. That's basically just all the fancy talk for uh, when a client uh, or not a client, a homeless individual utilizes um, a service from one of the local providers here, they're required to input um, that client's information into WellSky or HMIS. Uh, so kind of going off what I was saying earlier about the importance of HMIS, um, this kind of just expands into, it informs national policy and also informs local planning. So um, local policymakers and national policymakers are able to utilize the HMIS information and make better policies to support local service providers and in turn uh, support local homeless individuals. It also is required by COC program and federal partners. And we just heard from Colin on the coordinated entry and case management system as well. So kind of going into our research, we did a combination of surveys and interviews. And for both of those, there is a total of 31 questions. Um, and we had five topic areas that we asked the service providers. So those are intake process, WellSky training, WellSky comfortability, data usage, and Lane County HMIS, which Dan will get into these further. So these interviews and surveys were conducted over two months to Lane County service providers. Um, I put a snapshot of what our um, survey on Qualtrics looked like. Um, our team preferred to do interviews over the surveys because uh, generally people provided more in-depth explanations to the answers and we were able to ask clarifying questions. So um, Steve was able to send out um, an introductory email encouraging uh, providers to participate in this research. And after our first phase of interviews were completed, we sent out another set of emails asking for um, participation in the interviews. And um, after that was completed, then we went ahead and sent the survey out via email on Qualtrics um, to the rest of the providers who never responded. And we were able to be successful with the number of participants in that. So in total, we had 14 interviews and 10 surveys for a total of 24 responses. Due to confidentiality, we can't specify the providers here. Mm -hmm. um, we would have liked to have a lot more of these responses, and that kind of leads me into some of the complications we've endured during this project. Um, before we present our findings, we just wanted to be transparent about a few of the complications that we encountered. So we kept our timeline and scope relatively flexible due to the difficulties we um, encountered receiving contacts for the service providers. We wanted to be respectful for them and also be able to reach, um, reach them in an appropriate way. Um, but we encountered some difficulties with doing that. Um, and then our scope of work became limited and our sample size was smaller than we had initially wanted. Um, we initially wanted around at least 30 responses. And so we didn't quite get there with our uh, number, but um, more importantly though, we weren't able to um, see the provider side of HMIS um, just due to confidentiality issues. And so a bulk of our recommendations are related to WellSky software. Um, as that's kind of the thing that the participants mentioned struggling with in the system. Um, but as we never had to op the opportunity to actually see the system firsthand or test the functions, our findings and recommendations um, aren't quite as tailored or as detailed as we would have liked them to be. 
And with that, I'll hand it off to Dan to present our findings. Thank you, Hannah. So in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna be going over some of our findings. And as Hannah mentioned, we had five topic areas and that uh, I selected some key findings from each topic. So to start our research, we began by looking into the intake process. Uh, when a client goes to provider for service, the provider has a front door assessment. Uh, the client then walks through with the provider the different intake form. And seen here is the plus entry form, which is a very common entry form that is used amongst providers. So when we ask providers several questions around their intake process, uh, almost two thirds of providers believe some of the questions are unnecessary to the service that they provide. 43% believe there is an important information that should be collected from the clients, but is not. And almost three quarters of providers believe the client's willingness to answer questions of the intake forms affect data quality. When we asked several open-ended questions about providers' experience with the intake process, some of the key findings we heard were some questions can be triggering and bring up re-traumatizing experiences such as be around domestic violence and mental health. Invasive questions like asking clients race, gender, income, social security number can all be difficult to answer and have made clients apprehensive to seek services. Most providers understand the need for these questions but find it unnecessary to ask every single time they come through the door. The one size fits all approach with WellSky is a challenge to the different, different organizations. And this primarily revolves around running reports and is the main reason providers keep a third party database system. So lastly, the order and layout of the intake forms provide challenges for clients. Providers believe the invasive and re-traumatizing questions uh, would be better off at the end of the intake even after, or even after a client has already received their services. So next we asked uh, an array of questions around the level of training providers received using WellSky. These four quotes here I thought did a good job summarizing the range of thoughts that uh, we heard from the different providers. So program-specific training and more general training opportunities were all very popular themes among all the providers, as well as WellSky is viewed as an adequate system for basic use, but difficult to train on and understand the in-depth ins and outs that you can do on it. So next we asked about providers' overall feelings using the WellSky system. As seen here, this graph depicts providers' comfortability using the system in a more of a general sense. So 66% of providers feel comfortable, leaving a pretty big gap that doesn't. When we ask the reason for the score, even the providers that do feel comfortable using the system believe they are lacking knowledge around specific tasks like running reports. So then as seen in this one, we asked um, about the user friendliness for clients. And less than half of participants feel WellSky is an intuitive and friendly program to use. We asked them what they think could be done to improve the system. And the most common theme was to just generally simplify it, especially again, running reports. Uh, and then here are two questions that we asked um, specifically to the providers about how they collect the data. First, do you manage your data separately from WellSky? We found that the majority of agencies track their data twice, once for WellSky and once for internal use. We followed up with the question of, is it the exact same data or do you ask different questions? And half the agents asked the exact same questions, uh, mainly to run reports because it's just a simpler system for them to do it on. Since so many providers keep their data separately from WellSky, we thought it was important to ask what software they use. As you can see, half the users use uh, Office 365 product, primarily Excel, but some use Word and other uh, products. And then a th almost a third of users purchase their own data system just to run reports and track internal usage. And next, Allison is gonna talk about our recommendations. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan. So based on the data that we've collected in our surveys and interviews, our team has come up with three main recommendations for how to improve the HMIS system. I'll be going into them in detail later, but right now the three main recommendations are to first adjust requirements for the intake process, second, improve the user experience in WellSky, and third, adjust trainings to reflect the needs of program uh, service providers. 
So related to adjusting the in requirements for the intake process, the current process in Lane County right now, as it stands, is that service providers must ask all of the questions on the intake form prior to providing any services to the um, individuals that are seeking help. Um, unfortunately, we have been told that that's a relatively traumatizing experience for many individuals that are already in a very vulnerable situation. They feel uncomfortable answering questions right off the bat when all they really want to do is be placed in a situation in which they can be more comfortable and have their basic needs immediately met. So we think that by reordering questions, either by having these um, invasive questions asked after provided so after being provided services or after being uh, asked more basic information would be a very uh, more trauma-informed approach to this process so that individuals will feel more comfortable seeking services when they need it. Um, second of all, we think that uh, there should be an autofill function in WellSky so that documents can be filled with client information. Uh, while some variables may be changing and do need to be re-asked, unchanging variables like social security number as well as like first name are already in the system and they probably don't need to be asked it could just be a is this still accurate instead of a please provide so our second recommendations are related to improving the user experience well sky as dan had mentioned about 25 percent of our surveyed slash interviewed respondents mentioned that well sky is not user friendly and this led to this topic area being a major source of our um, focus in terms of what kind of recommendations we would provide. So we think that WellSky could use some better navigation tools like a search function or um, review functions for program managers to review what kind of data is currently being input. We also think that simple user interface fixes like hover over text so that people can see like exactly what an acronym means or what a report will do would be very helpful because the system is kind of clunky in the way that it is right now. And we also think that there could be more customization in WellSky. So users can have, you know, potentially favoriting their most used reports so that instead of having to look through 10 or more report reporting options, if they're only using one or two, having them pop up to the top or having only those two show up would be a very helpful way of having people not run, you know, accidentally run the incorrect report and have to pay for that service as well. Finally, we think that the current trainings could be better reflective of the needs of current service providers. Um, as far as our team has learned, Lane County's current trainings are adequate, but learning the ins and outs of this complicated system can take a very long time, and it's very difficult to be training on this WellSky platform. So we think that um, Lane County should expand access to the Lane County HMIS team's monthly meetings. Um, we've heard that there are current monthly meetings held between the Lane County HMIS team as well as program admins, but many users or many program um, analysts that are inputting data are not invited to these meetings so that they're unable to learn about current data policies as well as progress towards Lane County's goals in eradicating homelessness. So we think that we should just expand access to these meetings so that more people will have the opportunity to learn about progress towards goals as well as um, updated data collection and reporting policies. So allowing more people into these trainings would be helpful so that more partners will gain a better understanding of what Lane County is doing and will be wanting to do in the future. So in conclusion, our recommendations are based on survey and interview responses from partner agencies within Lane County. We understand that federal reporting requirements um, are mandatory to receive funding. So we hope that the recommendations that we have relating to data collection are falling within the scope of what Lane County can change instead of going beyond what we can do. We know that improving data qual quality will better identify the needs of individuals experiencing homelessness and that better data will ensure that more people will be able to get the help that they need. So we wanted to once again thank you for coming to listen to us today, as well as thank all of our participants that took time out of their busy days and schedules to interview us and help us learn more about um, Lane County HMIS team. Thank you again, and we're open to any questions. <clears throat> well, Dan, Alison, Hannah, thank you very much.
perhaps uh, I will invite you to the table, if you will, to answer questions. Ms. Bud, I'm gonna give up my seat as well. We would have invited Mr. Hill also, but he had a single mic and that uh, worked quite well, so. <laughs> Excellent, then uh, um, uh, Director Adams will begin with the questions from the board if that uh, works into the program, then uh, looking to the board for questions. Commissioner Buck. I'll start off again. That's good. Um, so from what I'm getting in between both the first presentation and this presentation is there's a lot of duplicative questions and questionnaires that are asked of clients um, that come in for basic services. And one of the, the things I was, I was hoping maybe Ms. Bud would be able to clarify is the difference between this system, the HMIS system, and our homeless by name count. Because it still feels like each system has some of the same information, but provides other information separately. And how many different systems are you and, you know, people who are tracking this and doing intakes, how many systems are they actually using? Because it seems like we've got at least two, three, maybe more common and potentially more and it's extremely is getting complex each time you add a layer of another assessment tool uh, in order to provide services. Thank you for the question. And and so the, the homeless by name list is actually pulled directly from the homeless management information system. And so agencies are solely just working with one system. And then we utilize that system to, to pull information in different ways that help to illustrate, um, you know, just specific information that, that we're looking to share. Uh, so, for example, the, the front door assessment uh, that we were talking about, uh, the VSPDAT, um, is also something that's entered into HMIS. Um, our assessors may have a hard copy document that they're filling out. Um, but it eventually does get entered into HMIS. And so it's all detailed within that one system. So you've got three, three so far, right? So you've got the coordinated entry. You've got the homeless by name count. You've got HMIS. And then it sounds like some providers have even yet another tool that you, they use internally that extracts that data and expands upon it as well. It, does that sound right? I would suggest that it's it's just HMIS and then it's a secondary tool that an agency may utilize for their internal purposes. So, so the coordinated entry wait list, the homeless by name list, the assessments are all incorporated within the HMIS system. Okay. So those are all combined within the same system. Um, so there's most likely two, then the HMIS system and then whatever third party system other providers might have. If they so choose to, yes. And is Well Sky a software system that we even have the capability of changing because it sounds like it is more of a national tool and so the only alternative we, i mean we could push forward these suggestions to that software provider uh, but it's really up to them as to whether they can or, or are willing to change it how many are, are there other options that are even comparable or or maybe better, and I know switching software systems and something like this is a major undertaking, um, but I'm just curious about the possibilities. Yeah, great question. So so what you suggested as far as simply being able to advocate for changes to WellSky is, is what we're able to do. There are some internal things that that our system administrator can, can do, you know, changing, um, 
you know, the order of, of questions, for example, on an assessment is possible within Lane County. And so I'll absolutely be taking a look at that. But as far as, you know, the, the hovering over an acronym, which is a great suggestion, um, it's not something that we can do within our power here at Lane County. And so I had two staff actually just at a conference that Well Sky held for administrators. And they we actually created a list of things that we wanted to make sure we emphasize to WellSky that needs to change. Uh, and the reporting in particular was one of those things because it is challenging. Um, it, it's something that, that you know, could take hours for someone to really understand how to pull reports uh, that will get them to the information that they need. And WellSky has been creating a whole new reporting system um, now for for over a year, uh, but they've not yet released it. So we're we're hopeful uh, that there will be improvements, but haven't seen that yet. Regarding your question about the number of HMIS vendors in the community, there's about six. Um, that hold the the majority of the the COCs in the nation, and I was actually a part of a, a request for proposal process through the state of Washington a few years ago, where I had an opportunity to uh, test drive all six of those systems and be a part of that process. And what I walked away with was just recognizing that the grass is not greener with another vendor. Um, and that while we may have identified some challenges with WellSky, if we were to switch over to Clarity or Caseworthy, um, they have their own set of challenges. And so while uh, it would be prudent uh, in the next few years to do a request for proposal for uh, HMIS vendors in order to go through that process, uh, it may not mean that, that changing vendors would be the best case scenario for our community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner Buck. Uh, very good questions, great answers. Um, next, we have uh, Commissioner Bozovich, followed by Vice Chair Trigger. Thank you. Um, so it, it's fascinating because um, about Well Sky and, and the VSPAT, uh, you know, because I, you know, I, my wife has a business and we run QuickBooks and Access, you know, so very, you know, similar, you know, QuickBooks, you know, is pretty universal across there. So your ability to ask for a customization for your business is near impossible. <laughs> so you learn how to adapt it to your business. And, and you know, we can't use QuickBooks um, to keep our customer, our, our, you know, she runs a magazine. So there's more than 10,000 customers you don't keep it you know in quickbooks that would be absolutely in incredibly bad to do so we have a separate database to keep track of subscribers and their expiration dates and mailing addresses and all that stuff so there's you know two systems um so you, you i can appreciate you know having to deal with you know back and forth between systems and all that as well as you know i i'm the commissioner for multiple years now that's been involved with our public safety coordinating council and uh i'm also uh been chair and vice chair of of aoc's public safety committee and i'm appointed to the governor's um justice reinvestment grant review committee so i, I get to see that side of of provision there's a whole set of programs and assessments. They have to question people that are involved, justice involved individuals, which cross over with this population heavily. So when you're talking about they're having to answer not only VSPAT stuff, but you know, HMIS questions constantly, they're also having to deal with LSCMI questionnaires and Werna questionnaires and other questionnaires that are that are assessing their, you know, criminal risk to be, you know, to be released. And, and so they're getting asked these questions over and over and over again. So our ability to maybe autofill would be huge um, for some of these people, because I can imagine um, particularly the, the ones that are justice involved and, and quite often they're also victims and these questions are, are quite often bringing up 
issues because you know as you're trying to particularly as, as in our post uh, conviction or or probation system trying to help people through their you know you have to do some kind of needs assessment so you have to ask about those events you know, domestic violence and all that stuff and then if they're being asked again in in you know their assessment for housing so i i just really want to appreciate that you know coming up with that how you know how can we make this easier for the clients and, and less traumatic um i think it's a really great point um and <clears throat> The one thing though is we do want to have data you know because that's how we the, the other part of this is in, in that grant review committee we won't give grants to things that aren't data driven or you know have have you know evidence-based practices <laughs> you know if it's a new system it also if if we're granting something to a new system it has to have a, a evaluation tied to that new system you know and so without that data we can't make good good decisions so uh, it's really important which leads to you know the, the prior thing about transparency the question i get quite often from the public that's not familiar with all this because they see it from the outside they know we're spending millions of dollars on homelessness are we making progress so that you know this data is important because it's what helps us report out to the public and be transparent so we need to have we need to have both. So um, I don't know if I have a very specific question like I had um, in the previous one, but I just want to say that this is really such an important topic. Um, and I think your recommendations around autofill, I think your recommendations around having more of the providers able to attend those monthly meetings um, are really good because you know I know that. Um, you know, I've been I've trained bookkeepers on QuickBooks, and sometimes it takes quite a long time to get you. Know, there are things you just can't even remember. You're supposed to tell them, <laughs> you know, until the third or fourth, fifth time it comes up or something like that. Oh yeah, I should have been telling you to do this. Um, so every time somebody can get in and have have a little bit of opportunity to get a little bit more expertise. I'm surprised people are using Excel though, because that is not a database. <laughs> And it's not that has has very poor query and 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 whatever's and and saving as far as the, uh, it yeah when I saw that as the the one of the most popular ways people are tracking their data spreadsheets were never intended to track data. <clears throat> Thank you, Vice Chair, and I'll have a few questions and comments regarding that. I, um, you're not the vice chair. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Bozovich, yeah. Vice Chair Trigger. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thanks for a great presentation. And it's really, it's really nice to see these two topics together this way, right? Um, and sort of building off of both those those comments, you know, there's that common thing in in uh, in data land of garbage in, garbage out, right? So we can collect data all day long, but if we're doing it in a way that doesn't serve we have to start with the end in mind. What was the problem we're trying to solve? And then how are we extracting data? Well, how did we input that data? So that's that's going to be true no matter what tools are being used. Um, and I've also used QuickBooks and Access and Excel. Actually, Excel has a million and ten functionalities that you can use it as sort of a workaround. My guess is one of the reasons so many of our community partners are using Excel is because it's free. Um, and so that just takes us back fundamentally to an equity issue, not only with the people we serve, but with the folks who are delivering services in our community and the kind of resources and capacity they have available to them to really do this work, which also connects to that issue of, you know, this company sort of monopolizing and um, monetizing and, and profiting, not that there's a thing wrong with profiting off of creating good products. And, and this issue of databases exists everywhere it exists in private business like commissioner Bozo, i come from nonprofit land there are a million uh, crms con you know contact relationship management systems for fundraisers and they all have different query functions and um some of them can sort of account for a misspelling of a name and others it can't and it looks like it's two different people there's there's a lot to that i can't help but think in this community with all of the um technology and software developing companies that we have, that there might not be some enterprising uh, software entrepreneur here that wants to dive in and look at a way to 
to do something specifically for this purpose um, because it's fascinating to me that 76% of our providers are using some alternate or parallel form of data collection. That that was the, of all the things, I think that was the thing that really stood out to me. Um, that's, that's an important piece of information. Um, is there really a company that's using a, that's created a software, a database for this called Caseworthy? Yes. It's a little cringy, sorry, editorializing. <laughs> um, so I guess I don't, I don't know that I have so much a question, although I am curious for this panel, you know, what made you choose this and what surprised you about what you discovered in, in researching how this all works, this data collection and reporting system? Yeah, I know. Me and Dan worked on a project last year, spring term, with Food for Lane County um, doing some HMIS work. And so when we were choosing our capstone projects, that's kind of what led us to this route. I don't know. Can't speak for Allison. Um, but yeah, I think one of the most surprising things that I've learned throughout this process is just how service providers should be the ones that... Um, should access their data the most in the best way like and they don't have that function really and they're having a lot of trouble seeing like how can we spread our services and how can we create more services um, and expand those and they aren't able to do that um, efficiently because of the trouble pulling reports and and so that's kind of the reason that they're they're doing other utilizing other um, software systems and using Excel and, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, Allison, I don't know if you have. Yeah, I was um, interested in housing policy after I had the opportunity to do a couple of um, internships with Washington State. And I wanted to see how housing policy and like the data driven, like how data is being used across the two different states that are quite similar, but still very different. Um, and I guess what was really interesting to me was being how like invested all of our community partners are and how they're like trying to be the best that they can be, provide the most service they can in a way that's the most inclusive and like helps the most people possible. But the fact that, you know, they feel like they're failing because of the way that like the data system is working or how they are unable to check their data as well as like edit it and run reports to see progress has been a little bit difficult throughout this program or this project because they all care so much and just having them talk about how they're feeling like the current system is working like the current system. yeah I would kind of say for me I mean Hannah kind of summed up how I got involved in this project as well um and echo both of their uh, key takeaways but one thing to me is um how many wanted more meetings and they were always that was a reoccurring theme that they want to go to more meetings and that they're sad that they're not invited to these meetings and only super users are and they're you know that information is not always passed on to them uh, so it's kind of this hierarchical differences and causing internal complications and a lot of them joked like well who wants to go to more meetings but uh and when we asked well they can always go to eight Link County and do the email help desk, which is probably the most utilized system and talk to Carly and the different people within the program. Um, and that's great for them. They all love that. But they, one thing that one of them said was, we don't know what we don't know. And so we don't know what to ask. So by going to meetings and being part of these <laughs> internal things, they can see what other agencies are asking where they wouldn't come up with that question themselves. And then the other key point or takeaway I had was they use Excel and these different databases because it's all very redundant information, but when they run reports, they're oftentimes not getting the same answers twice. You know, they say they'll run a report once and then they'll run it right after and they have two different answers. And they're not sure if it's their error, if it's something where, where it's coming from. And then there's also so many different reports with similar names that they're getting a mixed up on which ones they're even selecting. So they find it easier to just use Excel and run a query off of that, where it should all just be the same information and it's pretty standard. You know, they just want a list of names of who they're serving at that time. I think that's, um, I love that observation you made. 
not just who wants to go to more meetings, but that the value in going to those meetings is being part of that sort of thinking partnership and people riffing off of each other of learning and understanding what they don't know. And also what the workarounds are on the human side, not on the database side. So, you know, that idea of ordering the questions differently to build some relationship and trust and lower the anxiety level of, of the person receiving services before you hop. I mean, I know I bristle, right? You, sometimes you, um, you show up for, I mean, you might just be at the grocery store line and they ask your phone number. I'm like, I, why would I give you my phone number? I'm just buying groceries. Right. Um, so, um, so that is, that is really important. I think that that shared thinking partnership across providers of how to mitigate for the flaws and the problems um, with the sort of, sterile bureaucratic nature of having to collect data um, in order to secure the funding to serve folks, but remembering that it's the serving folks part that comes first. So I really appreciate that. Um, I think my only actual question, and and it may be more something to follow up offline, Steve, with is, you know, we have a new position here at Lane County, a data and analytics person. Um, and I know that's brand newly staffed up, and I'm not even sure the scope of that position, if there's any crossover anything we could be learning from from this or um, having that person take a look at system and these these challenges mr chairman uh, vice chair Trigger, i agree um, i think there's potential opportunities here with respect to process improvement um, i think as you um, and uh, commissioner bozovich have pointed out analogs in other areas in the not-for-profit sector or in um, the for-profit sector, you know, communities of practice around using software is a pretty common thing. Salesforce, for instance, and in the whole community that is in the business interest of the, the vendor itself to create. Um, it would be interesting to dive into this and understand what that looks like. I think there's um, within our local community, certainly we have heard business leadership indicate that they would like to bring their efficiency expertise to the table to help us as well as the broader continuum be more effective in using the resources that we have. Um, clearly, if we have multiple systems, if we're doing duplicate data entry, that's time lost to helping people get through. And so I think there's there's some opportunities. Um, we have the benefit of, of Ms. Budd um, newly um, here um, and the, the team at HSD, and she brings vast experience in this. But I think there's multiple opportunities for us to bring kind of a, a process improvement lens to this, an efficiency lens, and potentially trying to understand what we could do to support uh, users. <clears throat> Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Director Adams. And uh, you know, your presentation uh, confirmed things that uh, I not only suspected, but knew in certain cases. Uh, you mentioned the proprietary nature of the people that you spoke to. I think I know some of the people, some people who are finding uh, extreme difficulty with WellSky. We know WellSky is difficult to maneuver, and we know you can't generate tailored reports from WellSky, which you can from Excel. And Excel is not the best way to do it, but yeah, you can generate reports that are very specific to the information that's going to help you measure your progress. The individual agencies measure the progress. And uh, and Derek Adams and I have talked about this a lot. In fact, all of us have talked about how, how we can measure and report and then judge ourselves based upon how our performance and improve our performance. You know, I, I know this works. Years ago, uh, back in the 1970s, I went to work for a tiny hardware company uh, and we wanted to get big. And the way we did that was we were able to track our data and measure ourselves continually. And we got big uh, because we were able to do it and we were able to tailor it very specifically to what, to what it was that we needed. And that's something that WellSky doesn't do. And, um, and Commissioner Buck, uh, when Ms. Budd was answering um, regarding the different systems we use and how we were able to draw the information from our uh, <clears throat> HMIS to provide the uh, homeless by name list, for instance, and coordinated entry information, we can do that, but it's not as easy for, for instance, the mission to do that from, from our database. Um, and I'll say the mission very specifically because they're one of our larger providers that have had difficulty in the past um, duplicating entries, you know, having to do things twice in order to get the information that they need. That very valuable insight that you provided. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I'll mention that, um, uh, you know, we are, um, 
we are the continuum of care agency. Um, the Poverty and Homelessness Board, which the chairs of the Poverty and Homelessness Board at 1.30 today will be meeting with <clears throat> our administrator, Ms. Budd. We'll be talking about, and I, I suspect we're going to talk about some of the information that we've heard today and the information that we heard yesterday, making us better at delivering the services that we know we need to deliver. You guys, you're, you're all superstars in my eyes. Thank you very much. I have so many questions, so many things that I would love to say to you. Time is running out a little bit right now, but uh, I will state that uh, some of the things that we are tracking through WellSky, and WellSky is the, is the, uh, is the uh, package that we use, we have to do that in order to in order to um, to satisfy the continuum of care need, um, requirements that HUD places upon us. So we have to do that, but how can we make it more flexible? Thank you. I'm not going to go any more detail into it, um, Professor, um, and uh, I'll turn it back to you for a summary. But once again, superstars, every one of you, you and the two of your team that aren't with you today, all six of you, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want to make, a, I guess, a, a response to a couple of questions I heard. Uh, Commissioner Buck and, and Commissioner Trigger uh, asked, you know, how they ended up in their projects, um, just sort of as a, a bit of bigger picture of how we come about creating these projects. Um, I meet with with Greg um, and Steve and also Jeff uh, Kincaid, who's not here with us today, um, on a weekly basis here in, in the building, sometimes virtually. Um, and we kind of go over, you know, progress of our projects that we're working on, what are the, the kinks uh, in there, what things are, are keeping us from uh, getting some things done. But I'll, and then we will meet with the directors of the departments of the county on a quarterly basis. We have our next meeting this Friday um, as the ID generation process of, you know, what's keeping you up at night? What are your biggest challenges? Where could you use some help? You don't have staffing or knowledge or expertise, or it's great to get somebody from the outside to, to get in and look at it from a different perspective. Um, and so we've had this continuing process of what's what's new, what's interesting, what's challenging uh, that we continually go through. Some of the projects we had uh, today are projects that we started on two years ago and did small little be bits of, of those projects to say, all right, what's kind of the lay of the land? What's, what's challenging us? Um, so a couple of students mentioned they worked on a project in the last academic year that sort of was the seed of these projects. Uh, we also have a project um, in, this, in this same course with Food for Lane County um, on their data needs and their data challenges and how do they use the, you know, the demand data that they're generating to understand what's going on in the community, where should they be positioning resources. Um, and that project itself, we're hoping to then uh, be able to help with these other providers in the community within the HMS system and outside to see where some demand might exist. So we can start to look at it geographically and those types of things. So some of the continuation of these projects will happen over the summer as, as well. Um, but it's a very collaborative process between U of O and Lane County, um, trying to understand what the needs are and what's next and what kind of bubbles to the top. Um, so I just kind of wanted to make sure that there was sort of the understanding the students themselves didn't say, you know, what's really interesting to me is I want to do that. Not, not that we don't want to take that into consideration, uh, but at the same time, it's it's really generated by the needs within the community um, and across different partners. Um, I wanted to also kind of talk about some of the challenges we have in this process. Um, and I think probably particularly where um, we've seen these things come up most is when projects are potentially looking at things of performance internally and, you know, people become a little reticent to, to share information uh, about what's going on. And, and I think that's where, where Greg and, and I and Steve and, and Jeff try and work through some of those things to help you know, make the job of the students easier that they're not continually having to say, hey, we're not getting the information we need. Hey, we're not getting the information we need. Hey, we're still not getting that. And, you know, in this project in particular, there was a little bit of that that we we continue to push through. But, you know, they mentioned some of the constraints they had. I think we had some slightly higher hopes of what we might be able to learn, but sort of the, the resistance or the inability of the system to, you know, create access to that information, I think is, um, uh, limited what we could we could learn this year and, and maybe we'll take on some of that in future years but yes thank you professor clark um i i do need to apologize to the students of that, that last group they were overly generous in uh downplaying the constraints that they faced with with putting this work together um it, 
it was the perfect storm of a transition of directors, some changes in staffing, some misunderstanding that this is actually a contractual, you know, uh, uh, connection with uh, these students doing this work, that this was work actually you asked for this time last year with the HMIS report, wanting it to go further and have a deeper understanding. Um, our staff were just reticent to share the data, didn't understand why the data was, was needing to be shared, how it was going to be used. Um, and it it really delayed these this team in their ability to get that data and, and really dig in and work. So we are, in fact, a work in progress, even as we do this. We, we want this to be real life training for these talented individuals, but we don't need to make it so real life training that they, we're actually not even opening the door to help them succeed. Uh, so we did need to intervene there towards the end. Um, and we learned, and I think with greater understanding, certainly Director Gray is uh, excited about the opportunities uh, that the Policy Lab provides and has the longest list of any director I've ever seen of projects that, that we, she would want to have studied. So I think we have brighter days ahead. But to this, this team, I really do want to offer our apologies for uh, making the work a little bit more difficult and to uh, really crunch that timeline for you. So, so my apologies and my thanks. And uh, Mr. Rickoff, I'll say, I'll make a, I'll repeat a quote that uh, Professor Clark said at the start, and that is that um, Lane County takes full advantage of having a world-class research institution in the community. And I think that you've outlined of the fact that we can even take greater advantage and provide even greater experience for the students who wish to give us the benefit of your research, your deep research, uh, that uh, otherwise we may not, otherwise we would not have. And so thank you for that. And thank you for the ongoing relationship. So uh, with that, please. I just want to say a couple words. So I've been the acting instructor for this class, and I just want to let everybody know this group of students has had one of the most challenging school experiences, I think, of any group of students I've gotten to work with. They started in remote, so they never met each other for a whole year. And then they came to this process and got put on these teams. And I just really want to commend them for how they've pulled it together and recognize the, the struggle that they've been through and let you all know you did such a great job today. And you should be really proud of the work you do. And we should all be really lucky that we have these people coming out into our workforce. So go forth and hire them <laughs> and give them good recommendations. <laughs> Uh, you have exactly such from me. And I'll say this, that, um, you know, uh, Mr. Rickoff, you said at the start that I look at this as one of my favorite days of the year. You've exceeded my expectations. You've done a superb job. And to hear the challenges that you went through to get to the point that you're at today, bravo, bravo. Mr. Rickoff, anything else for the order of today's agenda? I believe that's all other than saying, once again, we are the should be the employer of choice for such talented individuals. Do we have employment applications on the back table? <laughs> <laughs> They're online. <laughs> Very good. Well, with that, thank you once again. And uh, the Board of County Commissioners is adjourned.